I bet you're wondering what all these planes have in common. Super Cruise is a feature that most modern fighters have. It is considered a badge of performance and it is like the membership of an exclusive club. So, why is it important? Usually, the explanation is not exactly what you would expect. So, stay till the end because what we're going to discuss here is not easily found anywhere else. Apparently, the term Super Cruise was coined for the first time in the late 60s and early 70s by the group of United States Air Force officers known as the Fighter Mafia. They referred to Super Cruise as the ability for a plane to accelerate and keep flying at supersonic speed without using the afterburner. Colonel John Boyd, who inspired the Fighter Mafia, conceived the famous EM theory of air combat. It is a subject good for various videos, actually, but for now it is enough to know that the theory advocated that maintaining a high level of energy, kinetic and potential was the key for success in air combat. The ability of keeping a constant supersonic speed was considered helpful to keep the energy high. However, Super Cruise was not a new feature. The first plane to accelerate at supersonic speed with no afterburner was probably a French experimental Delta Wing plane in the mid 50s. The first production plane to achieve Super Cruise was the F 104 at high altitude. However, it is not considered to be the first Super Cruise plane because it could do so only in a very clean configuration, with no extra fuel tanks and without using the flaps and the slats in cruise, as often the F-104 used to do. The feature, in this case, was of no military value. The first plane explicitly designed to supercruise was the British back TSR-2 strike and reconnaissance aircraft that, unfortunately, was never severely built. The plane was designed to supercruise at Mach 2 at high altitude and at Mach 1.1 at sea level. The Concorde was, strictly speaking, not a supercruise plane because it needed the afterburners to accelerate above Mach 1. The SR-71 was designed to cruise with the afterburner on, so technically it couldn't supercruise either. One may wonder why accelerating to supersonic speed is so difficult. Well, the reason is of aerodynamic nature. The behavior of fluids changes quite radically when we approach the speed of sound in the fluid. In fact, at transonic speed, a new type of drag appears, the wave drag. It is nothing other than the drag associated to the shock waves. The wave drag grows very quickly, reaches a max at Mach 1, and then it diminishes again above Mach 1, where the nature of the flow starts changing again. Now, if you are still here, it should be clear by now that a jet may need some extra thrust to overcome the wave drag and go beyond the speed of sound. In the large majority of jet, this is the purpose of the afterburn. The afterburner is part of the fascination that we all have for jets. The long streak of brilliant hot gas is always a sight to behold. However, the afterburner doesn't exist for a static reason. It can greatly increase the thrust of a turbojet over or a turbofan. The principle is easy since not all the oxygen in the engine flow is used in fuel combustion. If some more fuel is injected downstream the turbine and ignited, it can abruptly reheat the gases and cause a violent expansion that produces extra thrust. What is important to understand here is that while the thrust of a jet engine can be in practice roughly doubled with an afterburner, it is a very inefficient way to obtain extra thrust. That is, the fuel consumption can be three or four times or even more the consumption without the afterburner. The extra heat 
induces thermal loads on the engine structure, the nozzle and the nearby fuselage. Military planes have a limit on how long the afterburner can stay on before structural problems start occurring. Another reason why the use of the afterburner can be problematic is that the strong heat emission and the gas plume produce a large infrared signature. So, in practice, the less you use the afterburner, the better. Its use should be reserved to emergency and combat situations. Enters the Super Cruise. Speed in combat is very important. It has been like this since the dawn of air combat. So it is to be expected that a feature like the Super Cruise is kept in high regard by the pilots. The technical reasons why Super Cruising is important should be rather clear by now. The plane can reach and maintain a supersonic speed without using the afterburner and incurring in the relative consequence. Please note that super cruising still requires more fuel than cruising at supersonic speed, but way less than using the afterburner. A rough estimate of the fuel consumption is still 25-30% uh, higher than cruising at high supersonic speed. It is also important that the plane could super cruise with a military useful payload. Since modern fighters carry their weapons and fuel externally, their drag increases dramatically when equipped with an actual payload. In general, no plane can supercruise with any air-to-ground payload because they tend to be large and generate a lot of drag. Air-to-air -air weapons, on the contrary, may be heavy as well, but they usually generate less drag, even because in some cases they can be hosted in recessed stations. The obvious exceptions are the American F-22 and the Russian Su-57 that transport all their weapons internally and almost always fly in a clean configuration with internal fuel only. The actual performance of fighters is a secret, but still we have enough information to understand the importance of this feature. The F-22 is expected to supercruise up to Mach 1.8 and it is probably the fastest supercruiser currently in service. The Rafale is known to be capable of supercruising around Mach 1.4 with a standard air-to-air -air weapon load and one external fuel tank. Eurofighter Typhoon has a declared supercruise speed of Mach 1.5 with air-to-air -air weapons but no fuel tank. The Gripen EF with the upgraded engine has demonstrated a Mach 1.2 supercruise capability with an air-to-air -air payload and a fuel tank. The information about the Russian designs is even less certain. The Su-35 can probably supercruise around Mach 1.2 as well. The Su-57 has been confirmed of being capable of supercruising, but the speed is not known. I did not mention the F-35 because contrarily to what many F-35 fanboys think, the F-35 cannot supercruise. Comments erupting in flames in 3, 2, 1, 2. All the 5th and 6th generation aircraft currently in development are being designed to be supercruisers as well. And this is an obvious testament to the importance of the feature for the militaries. But at the end of the day, why it is so? So if you think that modern air combat is going to start with the merge, you're wrong. Video games have a veneer of credibility, but they are different from reality. Actually, pilots train for the merge and close combat because it may always happen, but they prefer keeping a healthy distance from the enemy and fight beyond the visual range. What they want to do is making full use of the weapon's kinematic performance. If you have watched my older videos about air-to-air -air missiles, you will know that the missile range and the ability to hit the target is not expressed by a fixed number, but it depends from the flight profile, the altitude at which the plane and the missile are flying, and crucially, the energy it can muster. A flight profile that chases the plane rather than anticipating it, or a trajectory with many curves, 
is very energy inefficient. It would shorten the useful range and reduce the ability to hit the target. A lob trajectory, on the contrary, may be very efficient because the weapon will fly in, in thin air with low drag for most of the, uh, of the trajectory and it will still have energy at the end of the path to maneuver and hit the target, aided by gravity. Now, what do you think will be the difference if the same weapon is launched at Mach 0.8 or at Mach 1.4? In the second case, it will have already a lot more energy that will add to the missile on propulsion, extending the range and the flight envelope. This will happen not only because the speed is higher, but also because the weapon will not need to go through the sound barrier under its own propulsion, spending a good amount of inputs just to overcome the peak of the wave drag at transonic speed. A supercruiser enters the fight already at an ideal speed to use the long-range weapons. A non-supercruiser will need to accelerate first using the afterburner or accept the weapon range penalty. Notice it will also be using the afterburner after jettisoning the fuel tanks to be ready to close combat should it happen. That is, it will burn a lot of fuel exactly when its fuel capacity is reduced. This may severely affect the persistence in combat of the plane, while the supercruiser can keep flying at a speed suitable for air combat and stay in the fight for way longer. But this is not the end. The faster a plane flies, the more the missile needs to lead the trajectory to calculate the an impact point the more it will need to veer off course if the plane changes direction, the more energy it will need to spend to do so. Speed is a defensive measure in itself, not only because it allows you to run away if necessary, but because it makes the interception trajectories inherently more expensive in terms of energy. Speed depletes opponent missiles energy. In general, a supercruising plane will have more energy than a non-supercruising plane, and this, at least according to the Western military doctrine, is an advantage that can be used to outmaneuver the opponent. The ability of keeping the supersonic speed for longer periods can be the difference between life and that. So, if you like this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing and you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very, very much for watching and see you in the next video.